Well, hello. Happy Wednesday to you if you're watching live, if you're watching later on YouTube. Happy whatever day it might be to you. Um, I'm Rudy Maxa. I'm your genial host, and I'm delighted to have you here with me today. This is our sixth webcast. We're learning more every single time. I should probably tip this up a little more like that. Uh, today, my guests are Phil Rosenthal. You may know his name. He is the creator of Everybody Loves Raymond, which I'm told is the third most successful comedy show um, in the history of the United States. And uh, I'm also going to be talking to Doug Lansky. Oh, by the way, he also hosts a series uh, called uh, Somebody Feed Phil, which you may have seen on Netflix. We'll have some news about a new series coming up when he joins us. Um, we're also going to be joined by Doug Lansky. He's a Stockholm-based travel writer. He's from Minneapolis, actually. He's an American, and we're going to talk to him a little about uh, Sweden and their sort of outlier way of dealing with uh, uh, the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, and how tourism in the Nordic countries uh, might be beginning to open up, uh, at least for some people, not necessarily Americans, which is a whole another topic. Next week, we're going to talk with uh, Patrick Smith. You may know him. He's a pilot for a major U.S. airline flying commercially, um, and he writes a very popular blog called uh, Ask the Pilot. And he has a whole lot of thoughts about what flying is going to be like in a post, uh, well, when we're all allowed to go flying again or, or have the energy to go out flying again. That'll be next week. We'll talk with Patrick Smith. Um, first, I want to start, as I always do, with a glass of wine and uh, to do a little traveling with the wine. I've had a couple of people who watch this say, what's this got to do with travel? Wine has a lot to do with travel. It's a great reason to travel, first of all, to go to a wine uh, wine country to a, or to a winery. And also, depending on where the wine's from, you can sometimes be reminded of having been there or tasted it in, a, in the country it was made, or maybe it takes it takes you back to uh, a, a great meal you had. I thought we'd go to Croatia for this one. This is a Croatian wine, eminently affordable. It's called a, a Plavina, which is actually the style of grape. Uh, now, in Croatia, uh, Croatia has a great history of, of growing grapes for wine. In fact, what we know as Malbec um, is said to have started as uh, the grape in Croatia and was smuggled to the United States. Um, one of the best known American winemakers um, is a guy who brought his talents from Croatia uh, to the United States, and he became famous. Um, his name is Mike Grigic, G-R-G-I-C-H. Maybe you know Grigic Winery or Grigic Wines. Mike Grigic became famous uh, back in 1976, you may remember the famous Paris wine tasting in which uh, American wines were pitted against French wines. And of course, the French thought, this is a, this is a hands down win. The number one, the favorite of all the judges who were French, was a white wine from uh, uh, Chateau Montalena in Napa. And the man who made it was Mike Grigic. So he uh, then went on to start his own winery. He still has one Croatia, but he, he also went back to his homeland of Croatia and took to them uh, some of the winemaking techniques he had picked up in California. So Croatian wine, thanks to Mike Grigic and thanks to his experience in Napa, has gotten a lot better. Now, the two, uh, the two best-known Croatian grape uh, varieties are not this, are not this, not the Plavina grape. They are the uh, Mali, uh, the... the uh, What's it called? It's a, the Plavic Mali and the Bobik. Um, but this is from the Dalmatian coast, uh, which is not necessarily, it's a historical designation. It's not an official county or state of uh, Croatia, but it's from the Dalmatian coast where um, uh, Dubrovnik and uh, the largest town in uh, Croatia called Split uh, are located. So I'm going to taste it. It's said to be have a little more finesse than many Croatian wines, which can be very, very... Uh, I don't want to say coarse because that has a bad implication, but but very big on the mouth and big on the taste. Has a nice smell. It almost tastes like a Pinot Noir, a little darker than a Pinot Noir. You can see it's pretty dark. This one needs a little air. This costs fifteen dollars, by the way. It's very Croatian wines are very are, are very very good. Um, I would, I would recommend sometimes you try wines out of your comfort area. I mean, if you only drink French or American wines or Australian or New Zealand or even German, try a country like Croatia. The wines are well-priced because they're not well-known in America and, and, and elsewhere outside of Western Europe. Uh, try a country like Georgia. The country of Georgia is on the same longitude as Bordeaux. So their wines are, are quite fabulous as well. And those can be had, well, if you're, in, if you're in Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, you can have a great wine for 
oh, I don't know, $13 for dinner or just an everyday bottle for seven or $8. Uh, they've just started coming to the United States and I hope to, uh, there's a wine distributor here in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I live, who started importing them about seven months ago. And I haven't been to see them. I know the owner, I'm gonna go see him, see if he's gonna get a couple bottles and see what they taste like. This is, this I think will get better in about an hour, but it's a little, a little unusual tasting. I wouldn't rush out to get this right away. Can't have a hit every time. Pardon the reflection on my glasses. That's that beauty light up there. I may try to adjust it later. Um, so at the half hour, Phil Rosenthal is coming in. In a couple of minutes, Doug Lancey will come in from Sweden. Phil's coming from, I think, from Los Angeles. We'll ask him. I'm going to talk to him about uh, Everybody Loves Raymond, uh, why he thought it was such a big success. And uh, I'm going to talk to Doug about Sweden and the Nordic uh, countries. Um, meanwhile, I'm looking for a guest that I'm going to be talking to him who wrote an interesting piece on, you know, we as Americans are thinking, okay, uh, you know, when are the doors going to open so we can get back on planes and go overseas to other countries and so on? You know, those other countries may not want us, frankly. I mean, we have a really high death rate. We have a really high number of people who have tested positive, even though we've just tested a small percentage of our country. And there are a lot of countries who are saying, yeah, we'll open, for example, in Europe, we'll open our, our borders to some European countries. Um, you know, the Schengen countries, which is most of the Western European countries, are trying to come to an agreement on a uniform policy of how to open the borders so that uh, people can transfer, uh, go across borders as easily as they have over the past couple of decades. Um, but you may find, you may read that, no, we don't want any Americans coming. Or if you do go to a country, one of the Schengen countries, France, Italy, Greece, the Nordic countries, uh, it may be that, uh, that you've got to quarantine for 14 days in one place when you get there. So we're going to talk about that in, in an upcoming show as well. Uh, let's see. Yes, I know the light's reflecting my glasses. Thank you, Susan. I'll try to fix that in a moment. I just won't look up a whole lot like that. It looks looks like uh, looks like a creepy, scary new uh, horror movie. Um, so yeah, so I I think it's sort of interesting that we as Americans tend to think about where we want to go, and I don't. It, it's very unusual for us because the American passport is one of the most widely adopted and and uh, in the world. Um, we need you know we don't need visas to many countries, et cetera. But I think the reality is going to be we're going to find that we're not welcome in a lot of countries quite yet um, until we get our death rate down and uh, get this a little bit under control. It's sort of an interesting concept that we as Americans have to go, what do you mean we can't? What do you mean we can't come to France right now? Well, we can't. We can't come to France right now. Um, I'm delighted you're joining us today. If you've missed any of our previous interviews, uh, please feel free to check them out on uh, YouTube. Um, let me see what this, there's a screen. I wonder, is that Doug trying to get in on my TV? Screen share on, might be. No, that's not Doug. Okay. Okay, no Doug yet. Sorry. Um, there are all kinds of little symbols on this thing and I never quite, half the time I don't know if you're hearing me or not, although usually you will text me and, uh, and, and tell me if you're not. Um, what was I saying? I was saying something about not visiting countries. Yeah, that's it. We can't go to France right now. We can't go to England right now. We can't go to Germany right now. And I think when European countries start, or, or Asia, or many countries in Asia for that matter, I think if you go to Hong Kong, I think you have to be quarantined for 14 days. Don't quote me on that. Check with, uh, check with the internet or your travel agent um, or an airline before you do that. But first of all, just getting there by airplane is going to be, uh, could be difficult depending on where you're flying from and where you're flying uh, to. And then we've got to get around uh, the fact that we as Americans are, are not as welcome as we normally would be in most countries of the world. It's an unusual thing. So um, let's see. Let's see if we have any word from Doug here. Uh, Michael's on the phone with him. Doug's having some technical problems. You know, this is the sixth episode of this webcast called I Was Just Thinking. And uh, interestingly, we've never, we've never actually, we've never actually gone an entire hour with, uh, uh, one little one little hiccup. He's going to be with me in just a few minutes. Uh, says we got we got our man Michael in London working on it. Um, Stephen Silver asks a question here. Maybe I can answer. Will there be a secondary passport, aka a medical transport passport, required for international travel in the new post-COVID world? Stephen, uh, you hit it right on the head. Um, I think some countries are going to require 
that you have a note from your doctor, or well, I'm using that facetiously, that you have proof you've had a, a test and proved uh, negative 72 hours before you land in a country. Uh, countries are discussing that, particularly as it applies to Americans. So you're absolutely right. Take along your passport. You may have to take along a document saying, yes, I've been, I was been tested within the last 72 days and I'm negative for the moment. And of course, as we all know, just because you're tested 72 hours ago doesn't mean that two hours later, you don't contract a virus that you don't know you have for another two weeks. But still, a document for 72 hours seems to be the standard that people are talking about uh, for traveling around the world. Brian, Brian says, I'll be happy just to visit Philadelphia. <laughs> yes, we will talk to Phil about his travels. So somebody feed Phil. Um, just looking at some of the hello success. Oh, nice guys there. Hi there. South Carolina, Cleveland, uh, Kayla, Brian. Oh, nice to have a lot of people here today. Thank you. Happy Thursday to you too, Kylie. Um, nice lineup. Yeah, if you've got a travel question, maybe I can answer it too before Doug comes. But uh, uh, but Doug is going to be with me in a few minutes. So so hang on. Uh, Michael's working with him now. As I said, we've done six of these. And I remember, I think the very first one I talked for about, no, I, I think the guest, well, I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter what number it was. On one show, you couldn't hear me. On another show, our guest had plugged his headset and his, uh, his uh, camera into his telephone. Hey, Doug Lansky in Stockholm, how are you? See if Doug can hear me. We have a picture here, but we don't have him live. Hey. Hello, Doug. Are you go. connected? Can you see me? You know, you're the most tech-savvy tech, tech, tech savvy guy in the world. I can see a picture of you, but I don't see the video of you. Is your video on? Yeah, let's see. It's, um... It may be that symbol in the upper left-hand corner. It looks like a railroad locomotive coming at you from the front. It's a round okay. circle. There, there you go. go. There you go. Oh, you didn't have to shave for us, Doug. It's only this big, I know. This is. I know, I know, I know. Listen, the symbols on here, my guests know there's one day I couldn't even figure out how to, it's a telephone symbol I have to click on to connect. And it took me like seven minutes one day. So anyway, nice to have you. You were in Stockholm. I have identified you as, I uh, should identify you not only as a travel writer, but also as a travel influencer, a guy who speaks all over the world on, on uh, su subjects like sustainable travel. You're a thought leader, I think you have on, on your website. I like that. Um, I and I, should, it, I didn't say it about myself. I just, there was a CEO of Longwoods International who said it. I, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a thought leader. I like thought leader. And do you, do you, I was thinking, do you have three children or four? Uh, let me think. Uh, yeah, <laughs> three. All from the same mother. Don't, yeah. you didn't have to think. You may, uh, you may also know, know Doug's work. If you remember, um, well, he's, he's written for, uh, Skift, uh, skiff.com which just closed down as you as you know he was a destination editor there and a columnist um he also has written for rough guides and he's the creator of a series of books for uh uh for lonely planet called sign spotting in which he encouraged people all over the world to send in some of the more bizarre signs you know because of translation problems or double entendres that weren't meant that meant and so on and he parlayed out a huge empire and sold it to newspapers all over the world and many sunday travel sections ran sign spotting for years so He's the guy you can blame for that. All right, you, you, you still do sign spotting at all, Doug? Uh, no, people still send me the signs. I just don't do that stuff anymore. It's uh, I had a good 20 year run and I just got signed out. 20 years you did that? 20 years you did sign spotting? Yeah. What do you do with them now when they send them? Do you save them at all? No, I mean, I think I've, I probably had 50 or 60,000 last count. I mean, I don't know what to do with them. I have the whole, I have an art exhibit in my garden shed that was touring around the world. I know you had big blow ups of some of the best ones and huge things people would walk around and look at. I know you had them in various cities around the world. Um, they, were, that, I mean, they were in Dubai, they were in Australia and uh, Sydney on the waterfront, uh, in, here in Stockholm and Copenhagen at the Fringe Festival in Edinburgh, all over the place. It was insane. And you had a little bit, you sold postcards with some of the favorite signs and so on. I tell you, talk about not having to pay anybody for your, for your editorial product. That's genius. Brilliant. You have the whole world as the uh, collecting stuff for you. All right, yeah. before, we, before we talk about travel and Europe and, and what countries are talking about opening borders and how and who can come and who can't come, um, Sweden has been is always in the news here in America because of its rather unusual approach to the coronavirus. And I think there's a myth, first of all, that you were all allowed to do anything you want, which is not quite true. It's not quite true. I mean, they're not policing it. You don't get thrown in jail. You don't get fined. Uh, but there are these kind of strong social recommendations that come from high above 
that say you shouldn't uh, congregate with more than 49, 50 people. Um, and, uh, you know, but they like when I go to the supermarket, I would say that, you know, if there's 200 people there, maybe one is wearing masks and gloves out of 200 and nobody gets there and sees that it's busy and seems to go home. Uh, really? The well, I know some of your cafes, busy. but some of your I, I've seen pictures of cafes where every other table is blocked out. Right. So there, most of them are doing that. They're supposed to do that. And there's some that have been busted for not doing it. Um, mm -hmm. But in general, I mean, they've probably moved the tables apart at some restaurants. So there's a few fewer tables uh, and they're a little bit more spread out. But like when I go out to eat, it's it's full everywhere. Well, let's the you know, the, the theory uh, to, to try to obviously I'm not a specialist in this, but having read the theory is that by letting the population have more freedom than most Western countries and certainly most states in the United States, that there will be created this herd immunity, it's called, where people, enough people will get it that soon it'll stop. But, but when you look at the numbers for the other Nordic countries, it's not so great, Sweden. Sweden, uh, Sweden has had uh, 30, more than 3,500 deaths, which is deaths per million, 349 people. Norway is right. per million, 43 people. Finland, 82. Denmark, 93. Forget Iceland, 10. I mean, they're way down there. But it's a Nordic country, but it's not obviously adjacent to you. Right. But it, it seems Sweden's numbers aren't that great still, even though people enjoy are enjoying life there more. The economy isn't as down as it's down, but it's not as down as much. Right. So here's the deal. There's two big factors there. One is they don't count deaths the same way. So for a while, people, a lot of places that they didn't die in the hospital, it didn't count as a death. So if you died in a nursing home, it didn't count. And in other countries. In other countries. So in here it counts. Yeah. So the way there's a lot of, you know, counting apples and bananas and it's not really on the same, you know, system. That's one thing. And the second thing, if you look at it like this is the first quarter of a basketball match, this is the way they're looking at it here. I know it's politicized and I'm not trying to go there, but the way they look at it here is it's the first quarter of the basketball match. And, you know, if you want to say that Finland, Denmark and Norway are leading by having fewer deaths, when they come out of lockdown, they're going to get infected. And whereas we're having this herd immunity, that means, you know, 60 to 80 percent of the population has it. So it's not really getting spread anymore because there's enough buffers in between. So uh, we'll, we're kind of have we've gone through that pain early and then we're going to coast and go less and less, whereas they're going to come out of lockdown and their numbers are going up. And that's what mm, all the health officials say are going to happen. I mean, the plan was really never to not get it. The plan was just to ever, even in the U.S. and in other countries, the plan was just to slow it down so we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. Um, and so, you know, how you go about that, you know, I don't. There's going to be a lot of after game analysis here of who did it right, who did it wrong. Um, but I mean, like, here's a really interesting way to think about it, Rudy. If you think of two islands in the Caribbean, think if they have 100,000 people each. And let's say they get five, at one island, they have five people that get it. And the health minister says, we're going to shut this down. And the prime minister says, go for it. And they shut it down. The other place, they say, you know what? We had five people that had it, but they went to concerts in different parts of the island. And everyone's going to get it. We have three respirators on the whole island. We can't do anything. We may as well not crash our economy. In six weeks, one island will be have herd immunity, let's say, and then the other, they'll have shut it completely down. And, and the one that has herd immunity, let's say they have 1% of their population that, that dies, and that's 1,000 people. Um, but their economy's up, and they're up and running. And so ugh, it's a tough call. I mean, do you put it up for a referendum? What most countries are doing is kind of a something like in the middle, sort of like a karate kid, like, you know, you know karate good, you don't know it okay, but if you do it in the middle, it's like squash like a bug. Like they're mm -hmm. doing it, they're not shutting it down completely, but they're, it, I mean, there's gonna, like I said, there's gonna be a lot of post-game analysis on this one, but I think the mistake is to look at these early figures and think of that as some kind of a measure of success because this is gonna go on for quite some time. True. Uh, Phil Rosenthal has joined, joined the room, my next guest. He's about 10 minutes early, but that's all right. He can join the conversation uh, if you want to put him in here, Tommy. Um, Phil, we're talking to my friend Doug Lansky, who's based in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, he's from Minnesota, but he's lived in Sweden for decades. His children are born and raised there, are being raised there. Um, and he writes for Lonely Planet. You may remember sign spotting in the LA Times travel section. Um, he yes. He curated those signs from all over the world. 
um, and put him in thousands of papers all over the world and did three books for Lonely Planet on it. And we're talking to him a little about the virus there. We have about 10 minutes left with you, nine minutes left with you, uh, uh, Doug, before we, we, we bring Phil, Phil in full time. Um, what are you hearing about border openings? Um, I'm reading more about Europe trying to either figure out a, okay, here are the countries we're going to let in because they seem to be having an idea. Oh, we're going to let those, whatever. Right. Hi, so, I've, been tracking, I've been tracking the flights out of Stockholm and it's like two or three weeks ago, there were 10 flights. Now there's 20. It's going up. So it, it kind of reminds me of like, you know, I, I put down some gravel and I keep having grass growing up there in the, you know, in the front of my yard and like the grass just some, I put a mat under it, but the grass finds a way to get through. And I feel like there are so many companies that are dying to kind of get their companies up and running, whether it's airlines, hotels, whatever, they're, they need to turn a profit. They're trying to figure out how to make this work. And then you've got travelers who like myself, who've already had it, uh, who, who don't fear it anymore. And we want to get out and travel and get back to doing that. Um, so we want to go and there's some daredevil people out there anyway, who just don't care. And so you've got these forces, both on the consumer side and business side who are pushing and pushing, and it's probably going to get some kind of head start. I mean, Iceland's opening up in June, they're saying to travelers, um, several other places are going to start to come online that the flights are from Stockholm. I could fly tomorrow to China, Doha, Frankfurt, Copenhagen. I mean, there's flights all over the place. If I wanted to, they just, America we don't. Can an American enter Sweden now without going through quarantine or, or can, can we enter at all? That's a really good question. I've had a few people ask. I have to check this out. They, there's a bunch of warnings up, but I don't know what the deal is. Here's the interesting thing. Stockholm is a little bit like New York in the U.S. It's the epicenter. Uh, people outside of Stockholm are scared to come to Stockholm. So I'm having a party in like two weeks and half my friends from outside of Stockholm are scared to come here. They think we're a bunch of walking death zombies with COVID, all of us. Um, so they're scared to come here. And what's gonna happen is we're getting closer and closer to herd immunity. So in let's say maybe a month or so, we're gonna start to hit that herd immunity. It's The death rate's already dropping. And then they're gonna wanna come here and we're not gonna want them. <laughs> it's gonna be. <laughs> And That's I've had true. several well, friends asking if they can come here in like a month. Like this is, could be a very desirable place if we hit herd immunity first in the world. Well, I, I said at the open of the show that Americans, because our passport is so widely accepted around the world, we're used to being able to fly almost anywhere. But in fact, it may be, uh, it may be the case that we're not so welcome in so many places for a while. I mean, there are countries saying we don't want Americans, you know, we, I mean, Asia, they're going, you know, Americans, you guys got some problems there. 84,000 deaths or whatever we're at right now. So it, it's, it's, it bears well, watching. That, that example I gave you about these two Caribbean islands. I mean, the one the island that shut it all down, that's like Greenland. That's like New Zealand. What do you do then? You don't want anyone coming and going. You're kind of painted yourself into a corner, even though you had this, you know, early success of shutting it down. What do you do when your 90% of your income is based on tourism? I mean, you kind of, it's well, I, tricky. I, I, think, I think yesterday's Wall Street Journal said Australia and New Zealand are about to agree that those two countries, the people can travel in between them. And then, you know, there's still, as you say, Iceland, which has only had 10 deaths, which is amazing. Uh, and, they, and they've done, they have done, I wrote this down. Iceland has tested 163,000 people um, compared to in Sweden, 17,000. I mean, their number, only, only the Faroe Islands in Europe have tested more people. And I suppose in the Faroe Islands, they've tested everybody. But uh, there are these, there's inequality in these countries. And I think as American, I'm going to go, yeah, time to go to Paris and have dinner. And I know we're, we're going to talk to uh, um, Phil in just a moment. I know he's ready to shoot a new series. They're going to go, oh, no, Phil, no, thanks. You're American. We, you and your crew just stay there for a while. We'll call you in a couple of months. Well, I think it's going to happen. Thing. I can go. I can go down the street here for ninety bucks and get an antibody test. It's not a hundred percent accurate. Um, but if I if it shows the antibodies, if I show up in Iceland in June when they open, they're going to let me in. Otherwise, if I don't have it, they'll take a test there, but they don't get the results to you to the next day. They said. So meantime, they're going to have a lot of possibly infected or asymptomatic people walking around, and that their whole plan of shutting it down to ten deaths could go right out the window. I mean, it's tricky, this business. We're in a very precarious state when we open up. And I was also want to say, I just want to plug one thing. Since this, I mean, as you mentioned at the beginning, I've been speaking at conferences, tourism conferences around the world, which, of course, 
shut down when this when this happened. Um, so I've started a new career as a YouTuber, much to the dismay of my teenage children. Um, and um, it's called uh, Rethinking Tourism. And it's kind of like, I, it's a lot, I'm doing like a TED talk every week on this thing. It's the most exhausting thing I've ever done. Well, uh, I saw it. It's, pretty, it's, highly, it's highly produced, by the way, too. You know, we put these talks up on YouTube, which actually get many more views than the actual live that we're doing now. But, uh, but yours are very highly produced. You're a pretty slick guy for not being a TV guy. I've watched like 60 hours of uh, YouTube tutorials about how to do Final Cut Pro, and uh, it's getting better. Every, every week I'm finding one, like, you know, now I'm adding music. I have a, I have a huge lamp here, you know. Yeah, look, <laughs> that's the one, like one step at a time. <laughs> well, good for you. What's it called before we say goodbye? What's it called? It's called uh, Rethinking Tourism. Uh, if you just okay. Google Doug Lansky and YouTube, you probably find your way to it. Okay, you can go to DougLansky.com, and I'm sure there's a link there. Lansky is L-A-N-S-K-Y, a Minnesota boy who went to Sweden and never came home, except to visit yep. occasionally. <laughs> Doug, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take I'm, care, Rudy. I'm Be well. almost back from there with the kids, so I say goodnight to you. Good night. Yeah, take care. Good night. Ciao. Yeah, Phil, I'm sorry you had to learn you're not going to be shooting this way from Doug, but... Uh... <laughs> Well, let's let's say, you know, be an old newspaper reporter at The Washington Post. You got to lead with the lead, which is, you know, if you bring your I don't know if you want to bring your head down lower so you don't have to look up or the or the computer up higher. I'm not sure which I think I think I'm I'm so new to this. Look, I'm 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 on an iPad. And oh, that's that's better. Bring it up a little higher. Bring the iPad up a little higher. Yeah, that's me holding yeah. it now. I'm in a chair and I don't have a desk in front of me. Oh, but, I see. So put your head right. down. I should I should really There, there, there. That's it. that's where we want you, right? Put your head down lower. You're looking right. way up. There you go. That's it. Hello. That's it. Otherwise, otherwise we were gonna give you a COVID test in your nose there. So keep now your head down. I'm beautiful. Face down. Face, face down. Face down. Yeah. Okay, much better. There you go. You. Um so let's lead with the news, which is that starting, is it May 29th or 26th? 29th. May 29th, the third season of Somebody Feed Phil. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. And that's that's on Netflix. And those are already shot. So those are, those are they all in the can? They are in the can. Not only is season three in the can, but season four is in the can. And they'll come in the, in the fall. We finished what? in the second week of January just before this stuff happened oh my goodness so you don't care about the borders and uh, well how no, of course i do how, i know you do because you want to travel but how how long does it take you to shoot an episode in each place a week uh about a week yeah so how many are, shows are in each of the season three and season four 12 like the previous one or uh five in each yeah oh okay so you did 10 shows yes you've done you've got 10 shows done ready to roll okay so season three when, and when, did, when, when you do yours how how many days do you have in each place we spend, it depends, you know, if we're shooting a region where we have to drive around a lot, like Tuscany or Provence, it's like six and a half days, seven days at worst. If yeah. we're doing a city where you, they're closer in like Paris or London, well, Paris is always difficult because, you, you know, but but if it's, a, if it's a town, we can do it in five, five and a half days. So but that's why I wondered if you had gotten so many in the can. Now, are they going to come out all at once so you can binge watch or are they one a week on Netflix? Uh, five at a time. Five at a time. Okay, good. Well, we have a big treat coming the end of May then. Yeah. Okay. And so the trailer, just, the trailer just came out today. If you want to see the trailer, it's a fun trailer. I did watch it. Uh, that's one of the elephants swatting you in the, your face with a tail, isn't it? That was the that was season uh, one or two. But that now the official trailer for season three, and you can see where we're going. I think you oh, know okay. where. Where we're are going. you going? Marrakesh, mm. Chicago, London, Seoul, and Great. Montreal. Isn't Seoul a good food city? Isn't that it's surprising? It's yeah, you know, it's a great. I live in LA. I live right next to Koreatown. So I thought I was oh. familiar with Korean food. And of course, I don't have to tell you that if you really want to explore a cuisine, you go to the source. Right. Well, you know what impresses me most about your shows? And I told you when I called you to invite you is your eyes. You always look agog. You always look, you look like a kid who just woke up on his birthday, opened his eyes, and the room was filled with balloons. That's it's an how, enthusiasm. That's how great food uh, tastes to me. Well, it's not just great food when you're just going down a Venice canal. You look like, yes. and I know they're beautiful. I mean, they're eye-popping, those canals, but your eyes pop more than anybody else's in the world. Uh, I'm, Any blessed other or, coach, I know. I'm blessed or cursed with this face. I cannot play poker. 
<laughs> That's and true. I do. There. And, mm-hmm. and uh, I am excited because look where I got, you know, where I'm from. I never, when you were a kid, did you travel a lot? Well, I was, that was my next question I was going to ask you. Yes, because I'm an army brat. So I grew up a, a lot of time a year. I moved, we traveled all the time. I moved everywhere, everywhere. But what surprised me in, in doing research on you yeah. is you didn't go to Europe till you were 23 years old. That's right. I didn't go anywhere. I think I went and, to and, Atlanta once when I was young. Atlanta, right. So and when you went over and you were doing a courier run, right? Where this that's is old, right. old, where you were taking a package for companies that I don't know if they still do, but I remember I'm a little older than you are, but you want to hire, get it with a courier company because they would pay your way if you would carry this package of, you know, blood or or you know, sensitive stuff that they didn't trust to put in the Drugs. belly of the Right. And then <laughs> Is that how you no, got I didn't. I, did, I, I never touched the package. Right, that's right. You just had to accompany it, it on the same DHL. plane. It was DHL at the yep. time before they had their own cargo planes. It was cheaper for them to send all their stuff, and I'm talking about many, many bags, as your excess baggage. And you being some kid who was going to get a coach ticket on Swiss Air to Zurich. And, and when you would, needed, somebody would come and pick up the bags and they were out, you, you, it wasn't not your problem. Even the bags. I, all I had to do was look for the guy in Zurich when I landed with the DHL sign, give him my luggage tags. And so was that the first place you went to as a, to Europe with Zurich? I think it, I landed in Zurich and then I had two weeks to do right. what I wanted. And my right. friend who got me the connection, he took the same exact flight the day before. So he waited okay. for me to my plane to land. We got right on a train to Paris. Good. And, and we had uh, like five days in Paris. And then we took an overnight train to Florence, where uh, on that train ride, I met friends that I would have the rest of my life because they were two kids who lived in Florence. And now they're grandparents. I mean, it's it's really, I don't have to, you know, I'm talking to Rudy Max. I don't have to tell you the joy of travel. It was so eye-opening and mind-expanding. It was the best experience of my life to that date. And every time I go, it is the best experience you can have in life, I think, is to travel. There's no better thing to do. Well, you're a great ambassador for it. When was the first time you – how old were you when you first got to Asia? Roughly. 52. Now, see, because I grew up in Europe, and my, the, the colonel would every weekend we'd get in the car and go somewhere. We go to we go to Bern, Switzerland. We go to Amsterdam. We'd go to yeah. wherever, Paris, yeah. everywhere. Yeah, I didn't get to Asia until I was like thirty three or thirty four. I'm a little in, in specific about I'm terrible on years. Yeah, but it blew me away. Of course, and now and I love you, it. Didn't you yes. go? What? What took me so long to get here? Yes, you know, in Bangkok, when you go on in the floating market, right? So, so you know, we're we if you're me. The only comparable experience is the it's a small world ride in Disneyland. <laughs> and they're not feeding you on that ride. No, they're not. <laughs> Disney's got nothing on this ride. You're well, going I just down the know- canal and you're going up to boats and they're giving you the pad thai they're making on the boat. And it's not just some, oh, this pad thai is pretty good for being made on a boat. It's the best pad thai you ever had in your life. Because and- if it was bad, they'd be out of business. The locals would go, no, I know what pad thai is. This ain't pad thai. You're out of business. Yeah. Exactly. All those street vendors, people say, oh, I don't want to eat street food in Bangkok. It's so bad. I said, no, because everybody in Bangkok, because their kitchens are too small, it's hot. They don't ever, they eat their meals in the street. And if a street vendor isn't serving good food, they're not in business longer than a week. I always said to people, oh, how do you eat? You know, you don't know what you're eating. I'm like, I get online and I figure this line is pretty long. It wouldn't be so long if they were poisoning people. <laughs> Okay, you must get the same question all of anybody who does travel stuff like you do and, and I do, which is your favorite place. And my answer, and I want to I, I want to tell you I want mine is is it's some place you discover later in life that surprises you. And and so when people say, Where do you want to go if I give you a free ticket? I'm gonna say, uh, Asia, even though I love South Africa, I love South America, I, I love Europe. Yes. But I didn't yes. get to Asia until I was 32. Gosh, you till 52. Yes. And so it, it surprises you. I think if my dad had been stationed in Asia, I didn't get to Paris or Florence until I was 52 or 32. I'd be all about Europe. So what do you right. say when people say, what's your favorite place? I have, uh, I don't know if, I, if I'm Italian from another life or something, but I have this affinity and love for Italy. I always say Italy wins. 
because you do say it is right, right. It, it, and you it, can't get your parents there, can you? I what? You can't get your parents to go to Italy, can you? Well, not now, but but I did take them years. I, I think I took them on two trips to Italy. Oh, did they like it? Oh yeah, yeah. They had been without me also, and I just you oh, know, okay. Florence was my mother's favorite city. And so maybe that, you know, that had something to do with how I viewed it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you saw my Venice episode, I know what the knock is on Venice. I know that the that it's the most touristy place on Earth. But it's touristy, I say, for a reason. Yeah, you open your show by quoting Yogi Berra. I don't want to go to that. That that what's the Yogi Berra thing? It's too it, it, it uh, nobody. It, it's too crowded, so nobody goes there or something. That's right. Nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. Right. It's too crowded, right. But there's a reason, right? And, and you know, you just have to be smart about it. I, I don't advise taking a big cruise ship there. I don't advise really? uh, going to St. Mark's Place in midday. Or July. Right? Yeah. Or, um... But, but it, by the way, even in July, after 7 p.m., it's True. yours. Yeah, it's true. Everybody goes back to their cruise ship. So yeah. so there's a way to do it. And there's so much more of Venice and the area to explore. You don't have to be where the crowd is at any given moment. Most places are like that. I don't go to Times Square, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. So, exactly. So, right. But I'm not going to knock New York. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, you hit the thing, the cruise ships. I think of both uh, Dubrovnik and Croatia. I'm drinking a Croatian wine. I always open the show with a wine from a different region to talk about it. This I is a Croatian. It. And uh, so D Dubrovnik and Barcelona, both of which the cruise ships come in. Yeah. And you're right. Nobody wants to go there because everybody, it's because it's so crowded, as Yogi Berra sort of said. Right, right. But what my friends in Venice they told me was that, that cruise ships come in, and I'm talking about the big ones, the 5,000 mm -hmm. passenger ones. Right. They dock. They've got the afternoon. They come, they maybe get a selfie on a gondola, they get a selfie at the St. Mark's Place, maybe the Rialto, they buy nothing, they don't stay in the hotel, they're not even eating because the meals are on the boat. So they're they free. spend extra on the meals in the in the place they want to see. I'll never understand it as long as I live. And it's I call it hit and run tourism. Right. Because right. they're not they're not helping, they're hurting. Right not helping the place so when i go like you i want to immerse myself at least in how it feels to be there if not live there you want to go mm -hmm. obviously where the locals go why because if you were showing somebody where you live you take them to the good place that you like yeah that's you know people say how do i find a good restaurant and you're right look for the lines of locals but also when you ask that concierge he's going to tell you where all the americans want to go because it feels sort of american I always say, where do you take your wife or your husband for their birthday or for a special time? And they go, yes. oh, well, that, that opens a whole new chapter when you ask that question. That's and, right. And they might give you a great. That's um, a great thing to ask if they're honest, if they're not getting a little, you know. Yeah, I know. But, but what the other thing my friend told me, who has a restaurant in Venice, a great restaurant called Alcovo. Have you been there? I have not, but I I passed it. I, I know. I know where it is, and I know it. It's a great restaurant. And you did a nice job there. Too. That's where the pork, pork chop is, right? Where oh no, is? is that where the pork chop is, or is that? Um, no, that's uh, Massimo's, uh, uh, Massimo's uh, Osteria French Chescanana or whatever. That's in Modena, but uh, oh, that's in Modena. Uh, the, uh, the pork chop is in. Uh, oh, I'll get it. Oh, this is what happens. And I didn't even drink wine. Watch the Venice um, show. Watch the Venice show. It's on there. Right? Yes, but uh, the guy, uh, my friend at Alcovo, told me that. There are restaurants in Venice and maybe other places in the world you've been that don't have a kitchen. In other you words, you know, I that was new to me. Yeah, frozen. I didn't know that. Made. I didn't know that until I saw it on your show. What's? But they're just tourists are going to walk in and they get served the food and they don't know where it comes from. So it's a menu in English outside. So they oh, let's eat here. At least we know what we're getting, right? They go right. inside. The meals are coming in frozen from the from a factory that's supplying many storefronts. And when you order your spaghetti and meatballs, the waitress goes in the back, takes the frozen spaghetti and meatballs, puts it in the microwave and comes out and gives it to you. And they I, think you don't know the difference. And I'm afraid that there's a lot of people who don't. 
I, I, that was startling to me, and thank you for telling me that, and I'm going to look into that more deeply. So My friend we, told me, so, so what do you do to avoid it? He goes, look for a kitchen. Look for a chef with a hat. You, <laughs> you never thought to, to look. Uh, Michaela says, Car uh, I agree with you, uh, Carnareggio is a gem of a neighborhood in Venice. It is. I think that's yeah. the Jewish quarter, isn't it? I'm not sure. Is Carnareggio uh, the I, Well, the, the ghetto, right? The ghetto. The ghetto, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the uh, Brian says, Times Square is a great place to change trains. I think that's probably. Um, well, the place with the pork chop in Venice is called Da Arturo. That's it. Thank you for remembering. Da, da Arturo. Stephen Silver says, I remember how you went to Italy by train in your youth, Phil, and made lifelong friends. Was that that first train ride from your first visit? That's what I'm talking about. Overnight train, third class, which means there were three sleeper bunks on each side of the compartment. So my friend and I had two. There was one open and this nice couple from Florence. She worked in a bakery. He was a metal engraver. They were dating. They were 23 years old. We stayed up all night drinking. She spoke a little English. He spoke none. We had the time of our lives. They drew in my journal the places to see. I have a picture in my journal. The Duomo. Yes, I should go see the Duomo. I should go see their bakery. And I went to their bakery and the dad came out and because I was American. Imagine this. 1983. The guy comes out and because I was American, he was like, America, John Wayne. Yeah. Right? Love, yeah. love, love, love. I sit down. It gives me everything from the bakery. People start coming out of their stores. There's an American boy. Let's feed him. And they start <laughs> bringing me food. It was like a fantasy. It was almost like in a Disney movie. I couldn't believe that this was the experience. I, I, you know, we used to be well, more than welcome, more than welcome. Now, I'm afraid with the virus, as your last guest was talking about, America is now the epicenter of this thing that people don't even want us to come. It's going to be a uh, while. It's going to be a while before yeah. we can go. I uh, have a special friend, a woman in uh, Bangkok, and uh, and she said, and 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 I, I don't know how the, we were talking on the phone because obviously I can't go see her there, and <clears throat> and she was saying, well, really, you know, no one wants Americans to come here, and I said, well, Americans have always come to Thailand. It's a big part of your economy. What are you talking about? She says, well, look at your country. I said, what? And she looked at it was in 70,000 dead. And I went, you know, I never thought about that reflecting on me and a whole country going, eh. I think the only place that where they embrace you like they did in 1983 in Italy is if you go to a country that used to be a communist country. They're so surprised to see an American like in Georgia, not, not surprised, but happy in Georgia and some of the Eastern European countries where they really, really are hoping for some kind of democracy like we have, sort of. And and so they embrace you for that reason. But you're right. It's it's it, 83 was. Let, what do, we probably should talk about what about Raymond? I mean, everybody loves what about Raymond. Well, everybody loves Raymond. Um, how, how how did you start? Were you were you a, were you an aspiring Hollywood writer, LA writer, and you created a sitcom in your mind, or how did you even get into the business? Well, I, I studied theater in school. Yeah, I went okay. To University on Long Island, and I, I thought I would just be, uh, all I wanted to be was funny on stage. And I didn't know when I was a little kid watching TV that there was writing and directing and producing. And in college, they made me take all these courses to get my Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in things I knew I would never use, like English. <laughs> and and uh, I, but I studied play analysis and directing and producing, and you had to put up shows and write shows and things. I didn't know I would use any of this. And then I graduated and I tried to get work, I thought, as a character actor, comedic actor. And it's very hard. I don't have to tell people out there that that it's a, it's a very crowded field. So some friends of mine, after years of bouncing around, wrote a show for ourselves to be in. And that was my transition to writing. And then I I didn't know what to write about. So I drew on my own experiences and I moved to Hollywood and I got a partner and we got hired because they liked our work. And so we worked for five years on different shows. And existing then, shows that were existing. Oh, or starting. But, starting um, in your writing. We were working for mm -hmm. other people. And right. then I wrote on, on a show called Coach. And I, I worked on that show for about a year on my own. And that year I got sent a tape of a comedian named Ray Romano. And that what they the way it works in Hollywood is that comedians are looking for writers to create shows for them. 
and mm. people who write are looking for comedians to create shows for. So we met at a deli and he started telling me about just his life, his family, just as I would ask you, uh, getting to know you, where you're from, what's your family. About. And we didn't know that that would be the show. But for every story he had about his crazy Italian family, I had one about my Fakakta Jewish family. Right. It turns out we're we're kind of similar. All problems mm -hmm. are solved with food, and the mother never leaves you alone. <laughs> and and so that became Everybody Loves Rain. And was that your first title for the sitcom? Uh it was a it was a, a phrase that Ray's actual brother used to say mm, because about he him. was jealous. And uh, uh, my wife saw it in the script that I wrote. I used it. And she said, that should be the title. And I said, I don't have a better title. And Ray hated it. He said, there's too much pressure. I can't. What do you, would you like it if it was called Everybody Loves You? you they're going to, I can see the critics already. Not everybody loves them. Right? <laughs> no, everybody wants to feed you is what it eventually turned out to be. So. <laughs> It's better, better than better, love, right. it's better to be fed than loved. And 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 my friend Tommy, who's my partner in a couple of things, said, and who's a huge fan of yours, um, right. said uh, that everybody love Raymond. Everybody love Ray, loves Raymond is the third most popular sitcom in like the history of the United States. I don't know who rated it, but is that an is that a stat you've heard? I never heard that. I'm very happy about it. Uh, I do. I'm, happy, I'm, with it. I'm yeah. happy that it's still on and that people yeah. enjoy it. You know, uh, we purposely, I can tell you this, if you want to write one of these, one of the secrets to longevity, I think, in this business is not doing topical jokes. No Trump jokes, right? Yeah. No. Not even, a reference, the, not even a reference, right? They're going to be dated. Yeah. He too shall pass. And then right. what, and what do we, uh, and, and then you have these dated jokes. You, so you do things about the timeless things in life, sibling rivalry, your mother is too intrusive, you know, your father is uh, is this type of character. You do character and situation, not topical. And when did you decide to bring mom and dad, it, your real mom and dad, into your food shows? Well, they're loosely, the, the parents in Raymond are loosely based on my parents anyway, so they've always been part of my uh, oof. Right. right. How did we both think of the same word? The same—that's an unusual word to come up with at the same time. <laughs> it's good, especially when you're thinking of two Jewish parents. The word "uber" doesn't pop in your head. <laughs> Does not come to mind. Right. Okay. Uh, so, so, so I made. Did a you, documentary. Did you take them along with you, or? I I never I I haven't filmed with them on the road. Uh, but but here's what I did. I did a documentary where I went to Moscow. Do you know about this documentary? It's called Exporting yeah. Raymond. They asked me, the Russians asked me to come over and turn my sitcom, help them turn my sitcom into Everybody Loves Kostya. Really? So I went and documented the whole thing. And one of the scenes in the movie is I'm having dinner with a nice Russian family, and the grandparents talk about how they're on the internet all the time. This was like 10 years ago. And, uh, I said, really, you know how to Skype? And they said, yes. And I remember I had such a difficult time trying to explain this to my parents. I said, let's Skype my parents in New York. So Moscow to New York. And then my parents, it just, they happen to be up. That scene is the best scene in the movie. It's mm. so relatable. They're so cute. They're so funny. They're, it's so endearing, the, the exchange between the Russian grandparents and my parents. It was just adorable. And so I'm not stupid. When I got the food and travel show, I thought, you know what the modern day equivalent of the postcard is? This. The Skype. FaceTime yeah. or the Skype or the Zoom, Zoom home. Right. So every visit, I'm going to check in with them. Because well, I love, please, yeah. sorry. No, I, I love they, the Venice show. The in, the Venice, in the Venice show, you call them up from Venice. You're in Venice. Yeah. You get them in their home in where? Long Island? Uh, I don't New where, York. They were in an apartment in New York. Yeah. Apartment in New York. And while you're talking to them, uh, your wife calls them. I guess she was in LA and was didn't know you were talking to them at the time. So yep. she calls in. Your mother takes the call and on camera chats with her as if you were like, you That's know, did this. 
didn't doesn't say, oh, I'm on the phone with, uh, no. you know, with Bill. I'll call you back. It's no, she starts no. talking away. Connie say she's going to be on for an hour. I got to sign off. <laughs> That's right. It's not it not not even. I'm on. I'm on the phone with Philip. I'm filming a television show at the moment. Right. No. 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 Right. Exactly. Which yeah. is obviously to me that's the best. That's the best part about them. Right. With, right. You know when we when we filmed, we filmed in their house, uh, at the beginning of exporting Raymond. I brought a camera crew in to film with them before I left. Okay. okay. So they're in the house. They never had a camera crew in their house before. So two guys with the big shoulder cameras. Uh, mm -hmm. They put a microphone down, you know, the the front of you, my mom's shirt. My father has to wear a battery pack on his on his buttocks. He's uh, he's complaining about it. cameras go on. We, I'm telling you, within five minutes, they're fighting as if nobody's there. <laughs> this is no big deal. <laughs> which is the best thing. That's all you want. That's what great acting is. You forget the cameras there, and you just behave. Right, but you would. I mean, most parental units would be in yes. awe. That they have their lights on, and there's a camera. They'd they'd freeze up and be at and first, very polite. And, no, but at first they were. This is the yeah. secret to reality shows. This is why you're so shocked when you see a reality show. How could they? Don't they know they're on camera? They forget. Mm. It's novel for a few minutes, and then they forget. Mm. Mm. That's human nature, I guess. Well, I, I know the Netflix show has gone and has been translated into different uh, languages and for many different countries because because I see it at the end of the credits when I watch it on Netflix. It's in Japanese yes. and all these languages. Yes. Uh, do they do or do they? Every Netflix show, every Netflix show, 190 countries, which is why you want to be on Netflix because you you hand in your five episodes, they push a button, 190 countries all at once. Do they dub the shows or is it uh, uh, captions? I think some are dubbed. I think you have a choice. I think that 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 forty languages I think are dubbed and subtitled, but then that goes out around the world, and then you can choose what you want. Did you ever appear on Everybody Loves Raymond? No, in, no. In you know seat? why? I tell people <laughs> why didn't I ever appear? Because I cared about that show. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, what's are you are you thinking of a fifth season of? Uh, feeding Phil, or what, what's what do you? Yeah, you know, I'm what, glad we came back around to this because I didn't want to give people the negative impression, or we're not welcome, or we're not, you know, we, it's a terrible time, and it is a terrible time, and we're not traveling. But this will pass. You know, it will. We all know it will. There will be a vaccine, just like there's been vaccines for all the other illnesses in the world. We're not going to be wiped out by this. This this will pass. It may be longer than we like. But I want people to watch, let's say, my show or your show with the goal of something to look forward to. Let's plan our vacation here. Right. Let's right. plan it. We've got all this time to plan. Let's use, you know, our heads in a positive way. Not, oh, I missed this. Remember what the world used to be. The world's still going to be there. People yeah. are still going to be there. The food's still going to be there. And right. the world is a beautiful, beautiful, loving place. And most people are so much better than their governments. And you want to meet them. And you want to eat with them. And you want to drink with them. And you want to hug them. And we're going to get back to that. I know we will. It's just common sense that it's going to happen. But we're so mired in the now. Oh, no, I can't see past, you know, how I, how am I going to live another week with these kids? Right, right. So just know that's that's it's coming. It's coming. And, and you're going to be welcomed and you're going to have fun. I think that tourism is going to boom like it never has before when this is over. Because people almost we almost took it for granted, didn't we? Our freedom, our freedom to go to the okay. coffee shop. No question. And, and sit with a friend. The, no the freedom to, to go outside, the freedom to travel. Uh, we take it for granted. We're not going to take it for granted so much anymore. Although human nature being what it is, we'll feel that way, this 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 joy for two weeks, and then it'll be back to. No, you're right. One, one of our, in the audience, a guy named Alan Carl is a buddy of mine, and he does a webcast called uh, Journeys. He spent a couple of years traveling around the world on a motorcycle, and he went to all yeah. kinds of places. And he wasn't one of these guys who stopped in for one day and got the passport punched. 
he'd stay in a city for a week or a month and get to know people and very great. And he just said, we are still welcome everywhere. And he's right. We as individuals, I think in one of your shows, you said it's governments that, that governments yes. that have problems, people to people. Yeah. I mean, and I'm not the first to say, you know, you, to sit down and have dinner with someone, hard to hate them, you know, in their home. You know, you're exactly. Right. My joke was if those boys from ISIS would just sit with me and have some chocolate cake, they, they, everything would be okay. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, a couple of people said, beautifully said, Phil. Thank you. Oh. Said, Wonderful, Phil. All about people. They welcome the weary and the curious traveler. There's somebody planning for the next. Yeah, it's it's, read, it's read great. The base, read the base of the Statue of Liberty, people. Yep. Here's Michael who says he loves that you use the term fakakta, which is <laughs> for, for fakakta is screwed up. It's, it's fakakta. It's one of those words, you know what it is as soon as you hear it. Right, exactly. It's, it means what it sounds like. Well, Phil, it is really nice of you to take your time out. I, as I said to previous uh, celebrity guests like you, that it's so great. You guys actually go, yeah, I could do it. You know, no, no, I'm shooting here. I'm doing that. Wait a, I minute. Wait a minute. What, what do you mean? You have trouble getting guests. You're Rudy Maxa. I love your shows. <laughs> You, I would come on any time. And well, I look forward to the day when you and I can share a meal. Where am I talking to you from? I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. I've been trying to get to Los Angeles to live. I, I'm from D.C. I say I'm from D.C. I went to junior high and high school. I was a Washington Post reporter. But forever. But I lived 20 years in D.C. And then met a woman in L.A. And I thought, now. And we were over a dinner party with other people. And we clearly. And, uh, and, and she said, well, I don't exactly live in L.A. And I remember saying, thinking to myself, how bad could Santa Barbara be? I can even do San for this woman. I do San Diego. I said, well, "Where exactly do you live?" The Valley, whatever. She's uh, White Bear Lake, Minnesota. What? That's what. <laughs> that's exactly what I said. I said that's it just sounds cold, and she said, "Oh, it is." Oh, that's you're cold. And six months later, I don't know, a year, I guess, about a year later, I'm living in. You know, we broke up nine. She wanted to go to LA too. She hated Minnesota. Hated it. I was. I'm an army brat. I've lived Huntsville, Alabama. You know, I've lived in all kinds of. I could tolerate it. Well, she she broke up with me uh, nine or ten years ago, and she meet, eventually moved to Napa. But several months later, and she's now living in Napa, and I'm still in St. Paul. And I asked my friends, "What's wrong with this picture?" So you Rudy, may it's time to reevaluate. I <laughs> my friends say that, especially in L.A. I spend a lot of time in L.A. I got your number, and I'll call you up. I I, I hang out with Mel Brooks. You you I'm sure you know Mel. Um, he, he, home, uh, uh, he doesn't come out nearly enough uh, for no, my take, no. but, but I love him. Uh, I, I have lunch with Carl uh, regularly and Norman. And, you know, it, I go out of my way to. That'd be Carl Reiner and Norman Lear, by the way. Right, right. Yes, I'm sorry. I thought okay. I was talking Carl. to you. I didn't realize we had other people. Um, <laughs> see, I forgot. I forgot we were on. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. These, okay. These are my idols. And yet, uh, after a while, they treat you like family. It's just the most, it's the sweetest, greatest thing. Well, thank you again for taking time out of your afternoon to talk to us. I really appreciate it. It's lovely meeting you virtually. I'll see you sometime in person when I can travel to L.A. again, where I'm supposed to be living anyway. So I thank can't you. Wait. I can't wait. Thank you. My guest has been Phil Rosenthal. His new show starts April 29th on, Net excuse me, not his new show, his newest season of Somebody yes. Feed Phil. April 29th, 26th. May, May 29th. Excuse me, May 20th. May, May. We've 20th. lost all track of time, Rudy. Is, is it May 26th? May 29th. May 29th. May 29th, 2020. If you're watching this on YouTube a year later, May 29th, 2020, the new season of uh, on Netflix of Somebody Feed Phil. And you'll see five shows. He's already got the other season in the can, too. Thank you and so I much. I shaved on there. those shows. I shaved. <laughs> my, my, Dad will be pleased anyway. So take care. Thank you, Phil. Bye. And thank you all for joining me today. Next week, we're going to talk to uh, Patrick Smith from Ask the Pilot, the guy who wrote the Ask the Pilot book. He's a flies for a major commercial air carrier. He doesn't want to name who that is, but he knows everything about uh, piloting and what might happen to aviation given these uh, times we're in now. So please join us then. And until then, you can find our past shows with uh, Samantha Brown and Rick Steves and Phil Caputo on, on YouTube by just putting in my name and a bunch of stuff pops up. And you can find Phil everywhere, his website, is his own name.com. So there you go. Thanks so much, you guys. Thank you, Phil. Take care. Bye-bye.